do the Lone Ranger thing first, get your feet wet, get some solid results, start living in it, or, or do part-time, right? Um, nobody's asking you to, to fucking, you know, uh, sell your home at a loss or, 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 or not renew the lease on your apartment and go live in a van. Nobody's saying that at all. At least they shouldn't be. Um, there isn't anything that says you can't do a staycation in the van. You know, so let's say, let's say hypothetically you go like um, three days a week in your apartment, three days a week in your mortgage house. Then the other five days a week you're in the fucking van. Or you work up to that. Maybe it's the other way around. You know, you're three days in the van, and five, or, you know, you see what I mean? You, you kind of gradually start shifting away from the first realm stuff, types of shelters, and start, you know, really start practicing Vaughn in for real. Um, and it can be more, and it can be more of an evolutionary approach, where you're just kind of getting acclimated, you're getting used to it, things that you never would have thought of before in terms of your own daily life and so forth, uh, where to go to the bathroom, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, again, in, in some ways it's not the destination, it really is the journey. And so make the journey as, uh, as, as worthwhile as you can. That's all I have to say for the moment. Hey, cheers to that, man. Cheers to that. And I guess I'll just, the last thing I'll say, um, is, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, physical liberation is one thing, and there's yeah, yeah, mental and spiritual liberation too. And, uh, they're all, uh, they're all important. And, uh, you know, just as practice is, um, you know, practice and theory and practice and philosophy and action are, you know, necessary dualities. I think all three, all three of these components, I guess you could call, uh, call it the holy trinity of self-liberation. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll go with that, I suppose. Uh, and welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self-liberator's paradise. Uh, the website is Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A, dot com where you can find Pasnia List, uh, the Craigslist of the Second Realm, uh, the private Pasnia map and directory, uh, if you happen to be vetted and have an account, uh, events at the Free Republic, such as Vanufest, happening September 30th to October 7th uh, this year. And if you want to reach out, whether to be vetted uh, for Vanufest or whatever else, you can email coordinator at pasnia.com. Uh, well, hopefully within the uh, the next few days, that is. Uh, the last week has been uh, fraught with nightmares regarding email and pretty much a lot of technology. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you send me something in the past week and I've responded, uh, wait a few days and try again. Uh, coordinator at Pazania.com or even Shane at Liberty Attack for that matter. Uh, Liberty Attack.com for that matter. Um, or you can always reach out alternatively on SimpleX, Telegram, uh, or where, wherever. Um, I respond to every email from a real human being. So if I ever don't get back to you, um, please do try again. Uh, anyway, today, I'm joined by Kyle once again for this third installment of our Vanu Shelters, Vanu Home Bases Revisited series. Uh, last week, we spent the entirety of the time talking e-bikes and uh, Vanu in cities. And uh, just a, uh, um, in, in just a moment, uh, we'll revisit troglodytism, uh, underground and semi-underground shelters. Um, as like the first section, the second section, flo- uh, floatels, floating hotels, decommissioned aircraft carriers, and bigger so uh, bigger seasteads, so the land and the sea kind of. And uh, if we have time, which we probably won't again, uh, we'll get to the Great Pasnia rundown finally. But I want to make sure we have at least thirty minutes or an hour for that. So we'll uh, we'll just probably we'll just probably nix that for this week. But um, we'll keep it on on top of mind at least for, at least for myself. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, first off, Kyle, uh, welcome back, brother. Uh, how are the uh, past couple of weeks for you? Uh, pretty much wild and crazy. I'll keep this one short. Uh, working the armored car job is not working out. And, I oh, I will say one reason why, among many, the math doesn't work out. Because if the metric standard is five stops an hour, and an hour has 60 minutes, well, um, that's going to be an average of like 50 minutes you know, per stop plus travel time between each of those stops, which, of course, is not possible. And that's, of course, if everything's perfect, if there's no traffic, if um, the distances aren't too long, and and so forth. And, of course, there's no, like, real issues with the client at each of the stops. So this whole five stops an hour thing is basically just not working out, especially if there's 50 stops on a route. So now what would basically would have been... um, a 10-hour route, we're expected to do in eight hours. So the long and the short of it is uh, math is not working, and there's a lot of gaslighting. There's a lot of uh, – so I've seen this with my coworkers in particular, the ones who have been there longer than I have. There's a lot of anxiety-inducing mind games that are being done by the supervisors and all that 
So this is not a company that I would want to be promoted to be a supervisor at because I've been watching the supervisors very carefully. And even if, had I had the opportunity at some point later to get promoted, I would be expected to act like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to do that because I have boundaries and I have standards. And last time I checked, I had ethics. So because I'm not going to do that, I'm going to be handing in my two weeks notice starting tomorrow. And I've already lined up something else. And that'll help move my career forward as much as it is. So, and that's how it is with private security, man. Sometimes you try to make something work, and even if you have high hopes for something, and then due to factors completely outside of your control, whether it be so-called key performance indicators or KPIs, uh, the metrics are bullshit and are irrational. Very first realm, very servile society, even to the point where other status, people who work in other industries, um, I tell them this stuff, and they're like, yeah, that's insane. And so, and that's been the, the consensus over and over and over and over and over again. Like people don't, even in the first realm, other people don't believe me when I tell them this stuff. And so it's like, okay, so even the other statists are saying that the kind of pressure we're under is is basically evil, even according to them. Hmm. So that's, so the armored car thing is going to be done. Oh, and okay. it's sad, it's unfortunate. I really had my hopes high set on it. But, uh, oh, and you'll love this part. And then, yes, there's a little bit of a preview into the private security series we'll be doing here, hopefully not too long from now, because I'm pretty much going to also take a two-week vacation, by the way, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, um, to simply say this. One thing that the company is doing that they're transitioning to, the traditional model was basically three guys to a route, the driver, the so-called messenger, meaning the guy with the money who would actually go to see the client and, and move the money back and forth. And the third guy is the, the the shotgunner, the guy in the far back with the shotgun. Well, they got rid of the shotgunner a long, long time ago, so it's basically two-man routes, your driver and your messenger. And now what the company really wants to do long-term is that these are going to be one-man routes. It's even worse because for the routes that don't involve the ATM, they're basically putting everybody in the small little – I'm trying to remember the make and the model right offhand, but it's these smaller vans where there's only room enough for one person. And they've been modified where they have uh, multiple different states inside, but the vehicle itself is not armored. So if anything happens, the windshield is the same as the windshield of any other vehicle. So the armored car is not armored anymore unless you count the built-in safe. Hmm. So that's what I've been doing for a while. I've been running these routes where I'm not driving an actual armored truck. I've been driving basically what the, your, your average cable technician would right. be driving, except those built-in safes. And that, that's it. So the armored car job is not an armored car job. And even despite that, I would have tolerated it had it not been for five stops an hour. Because there's five stops an hour on routes that are, 50, that are you know, high 30s, 40 stops, or it was the case the other day, 49 stops that then became 52 stops mid-route. Because the supervisor kept adding on shit, which they're not supposed to do. Um, for other reasons, company policy and all that. The company policy doesn't matter if they're just going to run roughshod over it, right? Because clients are whining and demanding and so forth. Um, I'm just done with that. And we'll say the more straight, we'll say the more detailed stuff of the private security series. But as of re- as of today, just in in terms of time right now, yeah, um, yeah, this is I'm I'm going to be re- resigning tomorrow, two weeks notice. Um, and it's not something I was gleeful about. This is something I do with a heavy heart because I really wanted to go be a supervisor at this company. But, um, you know, they, it, was, it was theirs to lose. Sure. So, so gotcha. I'll say about that for the moment. Gotcha. Well, I mean, hey, it's uh, um, to have a couple weeks, I guess, uh, where you can go at a little slower pace than the Serval Society, um, you know, work. Work uh, workload that you've been doing. Um, that'll be good. A um, little re- real relaxation too, I hope. Um, hopefully. But uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's. Uh, um, I'm glad. It's, you know, obviously unfortunate. Um, didn't pan out the way you you thought, but um, hopefully much better stuff and much better much better future. Um, but anyway, I guess let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and get to it here. So, uh, troglodytism underground and semi underground shelters. Um, so. In the past, I guess it would have been um, a couple months, I released uh, all of the stuff from Vanu Life and I think Preform Inform that I found on um, troglodytism um, and semi-underground shelters, that sort of thing. 
um, to try to uh, bring us all to get all the uh, all the material on in one place. Because um, for me, <clears throat> um, back in the sixties and seventies, um, I could totally see why this would not be feasible. Like this would be really really hard or kind of infeasible, um, especially with the, the the I guess the the standards of Anu. Um, obviously, like water issues. Um, if uh, I guess the the dichotomy that they that they battled with in um, these publications were basically. Um, for the sake of, you know, water and, you know, keeping your, your shelter dry, you want to be on top of a hill. Um, but that's like the worst spots, like, um, concealment wise. So you try to find like the best spot you can, you know, towards like a, you know, a lower spot. But one of the major issues they always had was like with, with flooding. Um, if you're in Siskiyou where they, where, uh, you know, Rayo was, um, if, uh, you know, after, after spring and the snow melts, nothing's going to be dry. Um, and your shelter is not going to be either. It's going to be flooded out. So, um, I think really the, the extent that, um, with, with that major, I guess that, <clears throat> that major hurdle as well as, as well as time. Um, I mean, it takes a lot of time to dig. Uh, and if you're, you're still with a, you know, a couple of shovels or something, um, and then worse, um, even worse is, uh, one of the, I think it was Rayo's first structure, Rayo and uh, Dr. Gather's first structure they tried to build. Um, and I think it's, he spent like months on it. Um, she stayed at the van and he, you know, went out, um, and, you know, like walked five miles and did a bunch of work on it and he would hike back, spent a bunch of time on it. And then it was discovered. So all that work was for nothing. Um, so I, I think like those are the major two, um, I guess the major two problems, I guess, to overcome with the underground and semi semi underground structures. But, um, and obviously cave-ins too, which that's not, that's not a concern. That's, you know, that goes away today by any, by any means. But, um, I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in, and and I guess in those prospects, um, for, yeah, for, for one, um, <clears throat> we've talked about it a lot on this podcast, but breakthrough energy, te- breakthrough energy technology, um, whether we're talking about like a Brown's gas, um, Lord's pump, which would just be, um, you know, basically hydrogen powered free energy, um, breakthrough energy. Um, that's not a, cause you say free people think price. And when I say free energy, I talk about freedom, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, breakthrough energy technology. So yeah, there's um, the Browns gas source pumping at water anywhere. Um, so that that's 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 a great way. So you know, for you know, whether it's uh, I don't, and I don't know how this would look. I obviously don't like a, like a dehumidifier situation. Um, there'd be a way to do it if you you know if you're, you're committed enough to it. Uh, and that's not to mention uh, we had Sky Huddleston on, and uh, I'm pretty sure I, I'll have to go back and listen. But I remember him talking about one of the applications of of his Bork engine, which. Um, it's kind of wild, Kyle. It's basically when, whenever it gets to the point that he's he 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 gets to, he's starting with small engines like for lawnmowers. Um, but um, eventually, you know, um, if you get enough of uh, some of these some of these together, um, uh, you know, a small amount of these together, you could basically have like a minute. Like anyone could basically have their own miniature power plant, like mini power plant, um, power plants worth of energy. Um, so like if that becomes plausible and I just saw, um, you know, like there's I guess I won't say anything on that, but um, there's a lot of work going on on that right now. And, uh, you know, um, and I, I bring that, uh, the Bork engine up specifically for the time thing. Um, cause one of the applications, applications he mentioned was like drilling. Um, and there was a special type of bit that he talked about too. Um, but I don't remember what, what that was. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of possibilities that weren't necessarily, that were, you know, weren't even really possibilities in the sixties and seventies. So, um, these are definitely still kind of the, that's why we're doing them now. Like and later on in the series, they're less practical, um, you know, a lot higher competence level, uh, and there's a couple technological hurdles um, that they need to be overcome before um, that's even really um, viable. But then again, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I don't know. People have been, I guess, you know, living underground for uh, for a long time. So, um, yeah, I guess the, the last thing I'll mention here is that, um, yeah, if someone could build a lifestyle of, of these underground and semi-underground structures... Um, combined with like, uh, you know, the smum lifestyle, like the, uh, the super hobos, um, that Ray, Ray wrote about in, uh, uh, Life, March, 1973. I mean, that's a, that'd be a pretty damn, damn, um, you know, good situation in terms of, you know, um, invulnerability to coercion, um, really high MTH. Um, but again, a lot of, a lot of technological and, uh, and competence hurdles. So, um, I don't know, I guess that's my, my kind of thoughts. I mean, what, what do you, um, what do you think, Kyle? Well, <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned the adage about free as in freedom, not free as in absent of price. It reminds me a lot of like the so-called free software movement, where people thought, oh, the like the um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is like the essentially the the like open source you know copy left 
computer programs and all that uh, would be free of price. And some of them are, but not all of them, because right. free software but as in free and all that. So there, there is an analogy there, or at least a, the same spirit, the same kind of thing there. Um, so when you start talking about more, it's not necessarily more complex, at the very least scaled up versions of shelters. Yes, it is true. Old Man Rail did mention about you have to have a rising level of competency to match. Otherwise, the MCH, of course, goes back to zero. Um, so once you start getting past, like, houses with uh, attached garages or something to that effect, you start talking less about what we, what the first realm would understand to be like a single-family home. You're getting away from that, and now you're talking more of if not necessarily a communal living situation, you're at the very least talking about something that resembles less of a house and something closer to like an industrial park where you could have different rooms, you can have different offices, you can have workshops, but everything is way more spread out. It, it doesn't have to be particularly confusing or sophisticated. It's just, it's, it's, I want to say more. It's it's more. It's closer to a mansion, but that's the mansion kind of implies a bunch of other things, right? Mansion implies ornate house or rich person's house or something like that. That's not what we're talking about at all, because even blue collar people can work in or in the first realm anyway. Blue collar people who can work in industrial parks can do. In fact, it's a, in fact industrial parks cater to both um, uh, blue collar and to some degree even white collar people and all that. So. The idea is more like the the uh, <laughs> the architectural design and intention and use of the space. So obviously something like an industrial park has a very different feel to it than a single family home. And I think what Old Man Rail was trying to say with something like an industrial park set up as a type of bonding shelter require, requires, relatively speaking, a greater amount of competency in order to have any sort of decent MTH, period. And so the only question is how do you go about doing that? I mean, do you, do you start having the underground village hamlet thing? Well, maybe, depending how big your cave system is, that would be one way of doing it, sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those decommissioned uh, silos, I think you mentioned in passing earlier, um, that would be sort of a kind of a reclamation from the state. Uh, adaptation kind of thing where a lot of the, it's not an ideal architectural design, but if it's already, shall we say, prefab, in a manner of speaking, then other than it being a little tight and cramped at times, otherwise everything's all there. So if it has to be move-in ready and you're not really big on customizing anything, it's like, okay, just understand this is former government property and now we're just using it. Now it's just home then sure, it could be, um, I guess you could say your decommissioned missile silos could be your good, your... That's, <laughs> okay, that's, I thought that's, I thought that's what you're, I thought that's what you're, so I, I'm definitely not, I'm not, I don't even know how you'd go, go about rec reclaiming old missile silos. <laughs> um, I guess my, the only thing, um, so I, I know like with decommissioned aircraft carriers, which just kind of feeds into the next section. Oh, that's funny though. I mean, sure. why not? I, maybe it's possible. Who knows? Um, yeah, maybe you're onto something. Um, but I just know there there have been uh, some decommissioned aircraft carriers where I mean if you have the right connection you can get one of them for a whole dollar, um, a whole dollar you get an aircraft carrier. Um, so hopefully we can forge one of those relationships and not be too um, you know compromised while doing it. Um, a dollar aircraft carrier um, would be wild. Um, it's like those dollar houses yeah, in Detroit. Of, but then but then the price of something like that would kind of beg other questions about yeah, like yeah, how yeah. bad is the spot? Is she still seaworthy? Like. I, at some point, there's do you not like do you know how to operate the nuclear um, or the nuclear power on board so you can power it? Because um, that was one of the I, I didn't think about I didn't think about that um, whenever I talk whenever I did it last time. I just calculated the amount of like about of like a jet fuel or whatever, and it's like no, they aren't operating on, on goddamn jet fuel. <laughs> yeah, well, well, whether it's nuclear powered or, or otherwise, it's kind of like can you use it and use it safely to the degree where it doesn't blow up in your face kind of thing. Yes, so extreme levels of competency. <laughs> Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be extreme. It just has to be in proportion, too, right? So if you, okay, let's, let's go back to single family. Okay, actually, hold on. Let me back up a lot. It's kind of like with Van Nomadism. It's kind of like 
do you know how to fill up the gas tank with gasoline and do it safely? Okay, scale it up. Let's say you get the single, the equivalent of single family home and you're in that for a while. Uh, let's also say, let's for whatever reason, you've got a gas stove. Can you operate the gas stove in the single family home and do it safely? Okay, then now we're going to scale it up one more time. Scale it up. Hmm. Can you operate the nuclear powered submarine and do it and do it safely? You see what I mean? It doesn't matter if we're talking about a van, right. a yeah, house, yeah. or a fucking aircraft carrier. Right. Sure. Can you operate it and do it safely. That's, I mean, I keep going back to that because it doesn't make sense if your goal is to pursue invulnerability to coercion, but then you place yourself in a position where you're doing things incompetently to such a degree where it does count as negligence, and next thing you know, you're in the fucking burn ward of the local, whatever local hospital they happen to transport your sorry butt to. Now, yes, I'm being facetious, but it's to make the point that you don't want to pursue, uh, in, your, in, in your attempt to pursuing the nuance, you do so, like, really badly to the point where now you have to rely on the first realm to save your life yeah. because you got yourself injured. And not, and not because of an unforeseen X factor, because there's always that. I mean, that's the kind of uh, eldritch abomination, Lovecraft horror type stuff, or cosmic horror type stuff you can't control. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about, like, easily preventable stuff. And of easily preventable stuff, it's like, hmm, this thing we're using as a structure for what counts as our shelter is powered by, uh, let, let's say, nuclear, or even if it's coal or something. Like that. You go live on a, I don't know, a train or something. Uh, can you operate, you know, the train and operate it safely? You, you see what I mean? It's, it's mm-hmm. the same fucking question over and over again. And it's not that it's not impossible. Like, if you're serious enough and you have the means, the money, and also the time to learn it, and maybe you even need a small crew, depending. Eh, depending how this all works, maybe more than one person. But if you can make it work, then by all means, please do. Um, I mean, I think everybody... In, that understands about the first realm knows that the housing prices for e- even your single family homes are, are not where it's unaffordable. There's a reason that millennials are doubling up in even really crappy two, three bedroom apartments with one bathroom. Um, and the square footage is not where it needs to be to the point where you avoid like casual diseases and so forth. And that's, and that's assuming nobody's hooking up and all that. Um, so that being said, yeah, so if you, if you basically decide to get, like, your decommissioned aircraft carrier or decommissioned missile silo or decommissioned, you know, government thing, shelter thing, um, then, yeah, make sure you learn how to operate it. <laughs> Whatever you need to do, whether – I mean, or, or actually, back to the missile silo, it could be also um, Cold War bunkers. I remember seeing those on sale a couple times, although that was for, like, a couple million for some reason. Um, what, I know one concern with the bunkers specifically is – the HVAC systems are not where they need to be to where you could live oh, underground. Right, places. ventilation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be another, yeah, that'd be another factor, problem. yeah. That I, I guess would, that'd be another hurdle. You want to make sure to get right. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, and so if you go down there for like one or two hours, you might feel a little lightheaded, but it's not going to kill you. But if you go and you sleep down there, you're not going to wake up ever again kind of thing. So whatever it is that you need to do to make sure that your shelter won't kill you, it, 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 that, that's, the, that's the common sense being uncommon kind of thing that I'm trying to kind of get at here. So, that all being said, um, for, I think you mentioned in passing about uh, Aurora in Alongside Night, correct? Yeah, yeah, it'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be a really higher scale application, but yeah, for sure. So, I, if you don't mind, I would like to mention that fictional example alongside another one, and of course that is the City of Rapture in the Bioshock game, especially the first one. Uh. Um, so, I mean, whether it's an underground kind of strip mall, like, like, like an interior shopping mall type thing, like Aurora is, uh, although that's, that's an oversimplification. There was more going on with Aurora than just that, obviously. They had a hotel and a couple of things going on there. Um, or it's a full-blown underwater city. And funny you mentioned about free energy. Uh, Rapture, anybody who's familiar with, with um, Bioshock remembers that Rapture was powered by the free energy of the of the, there was a geother there was a crack in the seafloor that were basically they were able to siphon a lot of geothermal hmm. through and that's how they powered the city. They didn't need petroleum. They didn't need even solar. That they it was all geothermal pretty much. 
Um, and then some other things that are more relevant to the plot again happen where they found other energy sources, and that's where it gets all the magical thinking and stuff more specific to that series. But in terms of how Rapture, the underwater city, just functioned just so they could even just build it and then live underwater in basically different pods that essentially connect to each other, and that was the city, it was all geothermal. And it, was, and it had to be in that specific area because of where the cracks were. So that would be an example of a type of shelter or elaborate series of shelters that actually relied on a very specific energy source that was limited based on, in this case, cracks in the earth. Um, now, something like Aurora would be a little bit more flexible, where you could pretty much just shove it pretty much anywhere underground, uh, from what I remember. Um, so something like Aurora is a little bit more flexible, it's a little bit more realistic that you could pretty much do anything with. Whereas something like Rapture is a lot of different things would have to come to play and then it has to be limited to a specific, specific location. So the MTH of something like Rapture, would, even if you did everything right and perfectly, would still be lower than a place like Aurora because at least Aurora has the movability feature of it or at least you could set it up in a lot more locations rather than being restricted to geographical features that are very, very right. unique for whatever. See what I mean? So yeah, the, the model, the model that, can be, rep, the, uh, a lot, or I guess the Aurora model could be more replicable than, um, more easily replicable than, um, you know, your Bioshock model. Um, yeah, with a Rapture, yeah. Yeah, so, and again, Rapture was kind of its own small miracle, but again, the main thing, and I really need to emphasize this because this is a big takeaway from this episode, at least I think so, you really don't, of, of any type of shelter that you're using, you really want to not have your shelter be limited to a specific geographical feature in the earth to the degree that if you were to try and move the shelter, it's either inoperable or wouldn't work or falls apart or, it, or becomes a debt, or in the case of rapture, becomes a death trap. You don't want that. Uh, you, you know, you need something that's at least a little bit modular, or somewhat movable. Um, I mean, hell, speaking about the decommissioned aircraft carriers, even something like a submarine would, uh, would uh, even something like a submarine would arguably be preferable to uh, an underwater city like Rapture, because at least the submarine Ability. is movable. Yeah, for sure. Now, now we can make some other criticisms about submarines, such as, such as the source of power, the fact that it's cramped as all hell. I mean, you could modify where you had some room, but it's still a big tube. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, there's obviously 20 million other details. You really do need a crew to pot to, to make it work. You can't just have one guy do it, as far as I'm aware of. Right. But general, but like generally speaking, um, something like a, a, something like a submarine would be preferable to an underwater city, at least of the kind of rapture, because the sub the submarine can go anywhere as long as it's as long as there's water in. <laughs> Most of the planet. Is like what is it? Two thirds, three fourths water? It's not land. Yeah, I mean, we're all restricted to land. Yeah, it's something like that because um, you know the seven continents. Actually, even one of the seven continents, the Antarctica. Most people don't live there because it's too damn cold. So really, we're restricted to six continents, really. So you know, both of the Americas, Asia, Europe, um, and and wherever else I forgot, um, Australia. Uh, you know, the only country that is also its own continent. Uh, we're basically, we're functionally, uh, you know, the human race, collectively speaking, all several billion of us, we're basically restricted to six continents of land for the most part. And so if someone were to go try to live on the water, whether it's in the context of minimalist sailboating, whether it's in the context of something like a submarine, or even some sort of city on the water, whether it's on top of the water, underneath, underwater like rats or something else, um, that's kind of a big deal because now uh, there becomes a very real possibility for expanding out and having actually uh, less population density on, on the various land masses. And not only that, but also something else people keep forgetting is that there is still a lot of land that is unoccupied. I mean, there was a joke that was made back when I was a kid, and um, it was actually in the suburban, um, when... Uh, uh, back when my mom was still alive and all that, we take the family trips during the summer. And something that my, my late mom would always mention about is from the interstate, we would look on both sides and she would go, yeah, look at all, all of the overpopulation. And there's like fucking nothing or there's crops or, or, or sometimes just dust bowls. 
And, and yeah, it, it's an oversimplification of the context that she made it, but her point was well taken. So when we did get to the cities or small, well, not even small towns, but even just the cities, and everyone stacked on top of each other, um, it kind of just begs the question, like, is this something that's done really out of necessity, or is there some, like, weird status stuff going on at play? And then, of course, those it's of us that know anything about anything, <laughs> it's, it's weird great, data great. stuff compounding on top of itself, right? Because otherwise mm-hmm. you just expand out. Just that people had enough uh, land and enough room, even from a purely medical perspective, because a lot of diseases occur because people are living on top of each other and there's not enough uh, room. Um, it's not just about sanitation and water and washing your hands, although that's also very important too. If you're in constant close tight quarters with somebody, there's a greater probability of disease transmission. Again, go back to the submarine. If you're living on a submarine, there's a reason why those guys got sick. It wasn't just because of recirculated air. Um, it's because there was way too many guys. Lack of sunlight, probably. Would be the biggest one. <laughs> there were, well, there's that too, right? I mean, there was a reason why, well, well, even the old-time sailors, even before submarines, there was a reason why the old-time sailors and the wooden boats with the sails on them, there was a reason they got scurvy, right? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, how do I say this in a way that makes sense? There's all humans can adapt to just about any environment and do it safely, but there has to be some sort of forethought and some degree of, of planning, or if not planning, at least adapting to the circumstances in a rational manner, so that you don't fucking accidentally kill yourself. Such as getting, if you're a sailor, getting scurvy, right? Um, it, it's kind of the same idea, uh, even where I live in Texas. You know, there's a reason why the various Hispanic peoples, the Tejanos and others, there's a reason why, like, mid-atrium siestas are important. And although some of the people who uh, are, shall we say, more European, uh, like to mock them, and unfortunately that's not everybody, but there are too many people that like to do that, um, and then make crass comments about lazy fill-in-the-blank, as I'm sure you're aware of, uh, with that kind of bigotry that's involved, uh, the reality is, bigotry or not, there's a real reason to take CSs in the afternoon so you don't fucking burn up and become like, you know, a shriveled potato. Um, mm-hmm. and so it's not just it's not just the sunburn, it's it's the heat exhaustion and the heat stroke and all that kind of stuff. And then there's also a reason why they stay up later at night because it's cooler at night. You take a nap in the afternoon when it's hot and then, you know, go find a tree or something, and especially if you work outside. And then you kind of have more of a life when it's at nighttime or at least a, a, a greater portion of the evening and all that. And in hotter climates, that's, al- that's, that's also not just a te- Texan thing. That's also a very southern thing, like in the Old South. So the stereotype, even of people who are, shall we say, European, there's a stereotype that even, you know, them Yanks up north, no offense, sir, but there's a reason why a lot of the Yanks up north, like, say, oh, them lazy southerners of all, of all colors, stripes, and flavors, they're just lazy. I'm like, no, it's adapting to the environment. And same thing here. Whether you're living underground in a silo, you're in a submarine, decommissioned aircraft carrier, something else, or hell, even if you want to do like a whole full-blown uh, imitation of mountain weather and essentially... Oh, yeah, Giant Mountain. Giant Mountain. Well, well, actually, mountain weather is more impressive, but yes, Cheyenne Mountain would count too. A mountain weather and or Cheyenne Mountain type deal where you essentially dig combination like half military base have our first round military base and underground city with like multiple boroughs and all that, you know, uh, you would still have to be adapting to the environment, right? You still have to worry about HVAC type, type stuff, make sure nobody, you know, uh, runs out of air and, and so forth. So like all of this stuff is actually doable and achievable. You just need to have some forethought to it and not be stupid, really bone all this stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Agreed, but but so I guess to to harken back to what you what what you said um, over the years though, and I guess what you've also said tonight, um, it's just about you know one foot in step one you know one foot in front of the other. It's not going from van nomadism to like starting and starting Aurora. That's not the way you do it. Um, it's kind of yeah one step at a time, kind of kind of thing. Um, well, when you scale up exactly, and, and the reason why is when you scale up, you're going to need people like. Exactly, and so, it yeah, it'll become easier. Yeah, yep, exactly. The connections that you need will um, will come across. Uh, it, it's the not just it's not just that. Like, I mean, I think I've talked to you. I think in private conversation, and this part I will mention publicly. 
like the importance of mutual aid and you know whether it's been like the people that i've been going to church with lately or whatever else like if you don't have that mutual aid as a foundational pillar type of thing then any sort of attempts at scaling up where you need other people to survive mm -hmm. in a scaled up von and shelter it's simply just not going to work and thus now we go back to what is your mch oh your mch one just went back and crashed back down to zero again mm -hmm. so i mean i guess at that rate you're better off in the minimal of sailboat or something right at least for the time being at least until the time you find better people um that's a good point you know yeah. it's kind of like well, so, so, so like when Old Man Rayo mentioned about pursuing our Vanuums and Vanuas mini cultures, it's not just say, well, it's nice to have other people around because it's, it's good for psychological and mental health and all that. It's not just that. It's also a very physical survival thing when you have a scale of Von shelter that essentially resembles what the MTH scale mentioned is like light industry or heavy industry. So when, you, so when we start talking about underground cities, I mean, it's not just the Freeport thing. I mean, there's that too. But, you know, uh, the aircraft carrier, the missile silos, I mean, whatever it is, we're essentially talking about some combination of, of light, the equivalent of what he described as light industry or heavy industry. And last time I mm -hmm. checked, Shane, those ain't one-man shows. Not by a fucking long shot. Can you do van nomadism by yourself? Yes. Can you do minimalist sailboating by yourself? Yeah. Yes. Oh. If you had a push on a shove, yes, you could do it. But can you really have your own underground city to yourself? No. Really? No, and you would no. and, 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 it, and it, only people that are looking for that sort of a thing that are looking for, um, you know, obviously you're isolated, um, you're isolated, you're isolated, you know, individual that wants to live in a cabin um, and just live off, you know, basically live, you know, live in subs, subs, uh, subsistence um, living. Um, that's they wouldn't they wouldn't have aspirations for something like this. People that you know build tours like Aurora or something like that. Um, yeah, there's aspirations for um, for community, and I think I, I mean yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but um, anyone who goes for these strategies will be looking for that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I I uh, <coughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm liking the. Um, yeah, like like in the flow of this so far, and it, and we've kind of combined combined the last two sections here. So I'll I'll, I'll bring up. Um, <coughs> So, uh, for the, uh, <laughs> so I suppose, um, let's talk a little bit, I guess, like, uh, I guess, well, I don't know if, anyone, if we even go there. Um, I guess, uh, more, more in context, not like big seasteads. Cause that's, um, that kind of gets into the political crusading thing and I don't really, um, the, you know, like yeah. the free ports or what? well, I guess it'd be, it'd be like, it'd be like the seasteading Institute. Um, yeah, that, that'd be like the more modern, but I guess Free Isles, yeah, I guess Free Isles Project was, uh, um, was it was you know voluntary governance. So it was, ba it was basically anarchy. So yeah, I guess the Free Isles um, model would be good, um, you know, would 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 be good. But it, it's it comes with its own. If you want to follow the Free Isles model, you've got to. Um, there's it, it's very complex when it comes to like um, corporations and you know stakes stake. I guess like actual, not just like the way that I do stakeholders here at Pasnia, like like actual complex stakeholder stuff. So um, they're they're trying to they're kind of like what you said. They they had a lot of four thought and, and forethought in it but um it just yeah just just didn't pan out but um <clears throat> yeah i don't know i i just love the idea um I, I i guess i first i first had the idea of the decommissioned aircraft carriers you know five years ago and then i i, I heard of the floating hotels um afterwards uh, when i got in contact with uh, a couple folks from the Mar marinia project and joined the team for a short while and interviewed actually one reason i'm not really a big fan of like what is commonly known as sea setting today um, is because of someone I interviewed on Marinia podcast who was part of the Marinia team, uh, Chad Rotowski. and people people will remember. Um, I guess uh, was it four years ago, a few years back or so. Um, he, uh, yeah. him, and his wife uh, had a um, you know a seastead off the coast of uh, uh, was it Malaysia? I think it was Malaysia. Oh, Thailand. No, it's Thailand. Uh, whatever. One of those countries. You can look it up. Just yeah, Chad Ortowski, um is his name. But uh, they basically. Um, uh, found him guilty of treason for trying to violate like the the national you know like it's like the national um i guess the national um authority of of the country um so they're like basically they're basically threatened like their punishment was death um so they obviously fled their their seastead and um but they lost um i mean that was their house so they had all their stuff in it. i guess they lost a lot of stuff so um yeah i'm not really too f in favor of like public seasteading like that now 
Um, but on a small scale or like not even see saying like that, but like a floating hotel, which, and this could, this could easily be turned into a commercial operation too. Um, which is, I guess was obviously one of the, the plans of the Marinier project. There's a, a floating hotel that was going for like seven or eight million. Um, and you know, like a hundred rooms, um, you know, a big, you know, a big bar, um, obviously all the amenities, it's a massive, it's a floating hotel. Everything you'd have at a hotel, you would have it on the water. Um, and there's also a spot and this is obviously there's gotta be a spot. People are going to be coming in and, you know, staying and stuff. There's gotta be, you know, boat spots for boats and things. But, um, I don't know. Uh, you know how, you know how hard on I was for, for uh, minimal sail boating back then. And like coming across this idea, um, with the prospects of like uh, a minimal sailboating community, like a mobile and minimal sailboating community um, around something like this or around things like this, like a floating hotel and then a, a decommissioned aircraft carrier, which would, again, come with more complexities, I think. Um, but yeah, there, there, yeah, there's there's a <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. And I guess there's even just a smaller scale, the smaller scale of this without having to acquire such massive infrastructure. If you just had a community kind of like the permanent floating voluntary society kind of thing um, uh, that Kerry Thornley wrote about. Uh, an innovator, um, where you'd, you'd more so have like small boats, uh, like a small community, like, like you'd have van nomads, like small boats, and you might, you might be able to find un uninhabited ocean islands to, to grow on or build structures on, or again, set up a Brown's gas Lord's pump. Um, if you got water, um, or other systems that are possible out there in the ocean, solar, etc. Um, something like that, I think is, is even, I mean, even far more plausible, um, even far more practical. And then hopefully down the road, um, you know, I know, again, I know, I know some folks that are working on kind of the sea solutions and I'm hoping at some point we'll have these, these bigger ones. Um, cause yeah, life on, life might be freer in the anarchy of the open, open ocean. So I don't know. I like the prospects. Well, I guess it really comes down to, you know, do you want to go all lone ranger about it or do you want to get together with people in some sort of either a commune or cooperative or have to be some sort of stakeholder and like, a some sort of voluntary a city kind of thing. And if the answer is no to the latter, more groupy stuff, then really your only option in terms of going all load ranger is basically your minimalist sail boating if you're going to do the water stuff, which is fine. There is a time and a place for that and all that. It's just, I think at this point, I'm more concerned about trying to set reasonable expectations for people because there is no, thing, no such thing as a one-man city. Um, there's a lot of different moving parts. There's way too much to do. Uh, there's also the issue of labor specialization, right? Right, division of labor, um, yeah, for sure. Well, well, that, well, that too. Um, but the point is that even if you could be a jack of all trades, you wouldn't want to be anyway. Um, there's not enough hours in the day and all that. It's something mm -hmm. you have to sleep, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is if people wanted to abandon the first realm, apartment complexes or even subdivisions like this one uh, that I'm looking at right now, even if they wanted to abandon this and try something different, then fine. But they, it, it would almost have to be set up almost kind of like a variation on the theme of an HOA where, yeah, you're free to leave at whatever time, but then there has to be like some sort of financial cost for getting out of your contract kind of thing, right? Uh, you buy into it and so forth, and you have your stake and all that. Sort of like a stockholder, sort of. Yeah. So, you know, and then... Very free isles so, 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 <laughs> Sure, yeah, but it's, but it's more of a financial investment, right? And so the incentive would be to try and make this uh, cooperative commune thing work. Where it's the whether it's the underground city thing or a underwater city or the or you know or whatever the venture is. In fact, actually that that reminded me of something. There was one company, and I'm not being coy this time. I can't remember the name. They bought a decommissioned missile silo, but they turned it into a. And it's funny you mentioned about the hotel. They turned it into this particular missile silo into a boutique hotel, and so it became a revenue. It was not a Vonu shelter by any measure. Uh, it basically became a revenue a source of revenue generation. So, unfortunately, it turned out to be only a seasonal thing, so it wasn't feasible long term. But the point was that, you know, what could be a type of bonding shelter could also be repurposed instead um, at some point as a potential uh, money venture or, uh, you know, money generation, income producing venture, of course. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess it would depend uh, exactly on the name. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to want to go to an industrial park soon because that's fun for the kids or something. I don't know. Maybe some people would be open to that. You never know. 
Um, especially if it's like young families. I mean, maybe they would like to get some space in industrial parks. So they can just, you know, stretch and chill out and kids can run around like inside what would have been loading and unloading areas, but with some modifications, it can actually be kind of like a relatively safe playground or something. You know, that that's for their exclusive use only kind of thing. I mean, there, there's a couple different ways you could play this. Um, and even then, it would be way safer than some sort of like really crappy motel on the side of the interstate. <laughs> so, but you see what I mean now. It's it's kind of like something that people would like like a higher level bonding shelter that would be more of a collective effort. Alternatively, it could be an income producing asset where you invite all the first round people as your customers, and then they just use it for whatever they pay you money, and then you take that money and use it for what you're really doing, and so forth. Yeah. So there's there's multiple ways to kind of skin a cat here. So for example, what you could do is buy the decommissioned aircraft carrier thing, fucking do like do like an Airbnb thing for like some sort of bougie type. Uh, the kids would fucking their kids would fucking love it, <laughs> and then you and then you take the proceeds from that, and you essentially use it for your actual Vanu shelter, which that would hypothetically nice. be in this case. Which would hypothetically be in this case either if you're going Lone Ranger your minimalist sailboat, or if you're doing the commune thing, um, maybe more of a Mount Weather Cheyenne Mountain type deal, because that's going to cost a lot of money. And and so it's not just manpower and it's not just money. You really need both, um, as, as well as a decent HVAC system and so forth. So, I mean, that's kind of more than one way to skin a cap there, is where you turn what would have been... Uh, a type of Vonu shelter into an income producing asset, and then you take the profits from those and actually use it for the actual thing you're doing. Uh, Gosh, somewhere yeah. else. Obviously. Yeah, so I, I need to, I forgot about this. We're speaking about, it's. they're not like fully, you know, quote unquote, semi underground, but I have to mention, um, so I, I uh, one of our, uh, one of our, you know, associates, colleagues, Rex, out, and um, I think he's, yeah, he's got a, a property in Oregon, I think, and one in Utah potentially. Couple properties, and he's doing kind of a st- like a stakeholder thing um, with uh, uh, using dis- decentralized autonomous organizations um, on blockchains. And the idea is um, basically, if you come help build, um, the, um, they're building greenhouses, um, but they're bar- they're putting the greenhouses, um, you know, burying them somewhat underground, um, you know, for obviously you know air and heating, you know, purposes. Um, but <clears throat> then people, uh, you know, come and help build these. They're pretty elaborate. I mean, he's uh, he. Uh, I guess he had, he had a first realm job, and for um, uh, you know, saved up a bunch of money, and you realize that you know, first realm life wasn't for him. So he wanted to build something, you know, with build, you know, building connections and building a network and things like that. Um, so I guess uh, he would be one of the, uh, I guess one of the um, partner networks per se, the Pazzini network. But uh, um, yeah, I would recommend. Um, yeah, I'll mention that for folks if you want to check that out. TVP uh, one eighty three vanupodcast dot com forward slash one eighty three. Uh, and there's ways to get involved. If you want to go out and build greenhouses today, you can. Um, there's places you know, places for you to stay if you got a van. And um, yeah, that that project is uh, you know very you know, very early on, but he's uh, he's he's doing it. Um, he's doing it. Um, but uh, um, yeah, Kyle. Um, this is, yeah, this is this is great, and I I love that. Um, because uh, getting back to um. What, yeah, what, what you're saying, um, using the first, using you know a first realm air, uh, aircraft carrier venture per se to pay for the the second realm one, um, that or I, I guess um, I I guess I kind of envision potentialities for, um, you know potentialities for both on one on one you know both on one maybe, but um, yeah I don't know there there's there's endless endless op- yeah endless opportunities, um, yeah we're coming up on uh, on about an hour. And uh, I know we're, uh, you know, I, I think that's actually works better for us because if we don't have a time, a time, you know, any sort of uh, time deadline, we'll be here for like three hours. So, um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's for <laughs> the we've best. Done that too, yeah. Most most <laughs> of the time, yeah. So I guess it's it's good. Um, yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll I'll I guess I'll I'll just close out by saying it'll be a good introduction to the Great Pazney Rundown, which will be next episode. But uh, um, you know, we're talking about all these various uh, you know Vanu shelters. Um, and you know the second round. You know the second round would just be the more general thing, but the the passing hour could be the you know the I guess the more I guess the a vetted portion of that. But uh, um, yeah, you can find any Vani shelter on there. You can find so you know uh, you know more so, like self sufficient homesteads like uh, I guess we're not necessarily 100 percent self sufficient, but ones that you know have meat or things that they can offer you. Um, you know um, instead of going to first home grocery stores, 
Um, homesteads like that, we've got, uh, like we've talked about, uh, city squat spots for van nomads. I might be going through various cities. Um, we've got, like, uh, local health food stores, uh, you know, local farms, places where you can get high-quality products that you can't find at grocery stores. Um, any, like, I guess pretty much anything that a traveling Vanuan might, might uh, you know, might need. Um, there's also uh, all the all the Freedom Festivals that are public um, are on there. And, obviously, the vision is to put a map together and uh, um, with all these various things, and you've got a network. It's not just one Vanu shelter. Um, it's it's basically a, a map to enable um, liberated lifestyles, um, like uh, gorilla gardening plots for folks who are you know gorilla gardening. Um, people can put those on there. People are you know pedestrian nomads are traveling through. They can have they can map out basically their food for the year or whatever. I mean, there's so many um, in all these areas. There's so many possibilities. The only um, real limitations are are your imagination. I guess your lack of imagination. So um, imagine big. And uh, and take action, and make it happen. So, um, yeah, I'm excited for the Great Passing Rundown. I it's it's been a couple of years since I really did any long in depth. Like I, I've done some interviews on, it, and those have probably been more in, more in depth ones. But um, it's coming together a lot more now. The the concrete pieces are, are coming together, and uh, the first big um, <clears throat> important piece of infrastructure project, um, the Passing Dot Chat isn't working right now. So um, getting that back up and running um, is one thing, but I got to find a better, um, that one only has one gigabyte of RAM and Jitsi needs at least like eight. So, um, that's why it, it worked fine. But when we get like 12 people on there, it did not function well. And then it makes sense why now. Um, I, I understand. So, um, I've got a, I, I've got a, uh, I had one solution that would have cost a lot of money and I wasn't really too, too happy about it. I would have had to, you know, crowdfund a lot more, but I, I found a much better option. Um, and it's a, yeah, remote Netherlands, uh, VPS hosting, except it's Bitcoin. So it's much more kind of the second realm route that, that we need to go. So, that, I mean, that's a big step. The passing map and directory is there, the, the vetted one. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of progress. So I'm excited to talk about it and really, really get, uh, really get deep into it and also get your thoughts on it too. Um, cause there's a couple of things, um, you know, just to tease a little bit, cause we got a few minutes. Um, there was the, uh, the mail forwarding, um, service that we talked about. Um, those need to be on there. Um, thing like, so yeah, mail forwarding, um, there might have been one or two other things, but um, there are definitely some some services needed. I'm excited to get your your thoughts on the entire venture and um, yeah, and also your yeah your feedback. No well, alternate ID too. It doesn't necessarily have to be, go to the degree of paper tripping, but definitely some sort of alternate ID, or even if it's just uh, privately issued identification as well, uh, where there's nothing necessarily quote unquote hidden about it. It's just parallel to the state in much the same way that, for example, um, your run of the mill, I'm not endorsing this. I'm saying it strictly as an example, but like, for instance, like a Costco membership card essentially functions almost exactly like a photo ID card because the actual member's name and, uh, membership number and, and photo is actually on the back of the card. You know, you know, any sort of you know privately issued ident photo identification could also be a thing as well. And it may or and may if not. If you're doing the free country form. model, you could do passports, as I'm showing on screen for the fascist tube Pasnia passports. Uh, this one in particular right. happens to be Naomi's um, Naomi Defense. So nice. totally authentic. It looks fu it looks great. I mean, you wouldn't expect it to be a passport for a dog, but yeah, mm. it is what it is. But anyway, yeah, man, well, I, I, I mean, like it. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, well, uh, yeah, I know uh, you've got uh, um, you got another call coming up, and uh, there's certainly always stuff to, to do around yeah. here. Um, but yeah, that was uh, another great. Um, I think you know very you know concise and and actually you know like not actually it's, not, it's like a lot of them are, but it was very you know um, a lot of a lot of powerful information. I think a lot of good thoughts in in an hour. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, next week or next, next week or, um, whenever we happen to get together again, we'll, we'll, we'll communicate about that privately, but, um, we'll do the great pass near rundown and, uh, it'll be a good time, but uh, anything else before I let you go, brother? Yeah. When just everybody, when it comes to Vaughn and shelters in general, again, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? I would rather y'all make some concrete day by day, positive, constructive steps towards something like the van, or if you're near body water, go ahead and get started with the sailboat. But for a lot of people, we're landlocked, so van. Uh, do that for a little bit. You don't even need to necessarily live out of it. Just like, I mean, 
I mean, if you're in an apartment, it's going to be uh, a little bit harder because they tend to, you know, be uh, the so-called powers that be like to crack down on who they, whom they perceive as being vagrants, regardless whether they're actual vagrants or not, which itself is actually a security issue for other reasons. Um, but it's but if you're like living in a subdivision again, single-family homes and all that, um, that is almost the ideal environment to try to make the transition from uh, from basically single-family homes to to van uh, and so forth. So again, I'd rather or you, you did decide to maybe not do van, but do something closer to uh, cabin out in the woods. Again. You know, just, you know, change, you, know, you do it the way that one guy did way back when. I can't remember his name or off him. Uh, but basically, you know, start building a log cabin with a chain Bradford and gear, possibly? I think, yeah, it was either him or somebody else. But, yeah, um, where I, the name of the book was something along the lines of how to, again, adjust it for inflation at the time, because I think it came out in the 80s, if I remember correctly. But uh, basically how to build your own log cabin home for less than $15,000. Which, of course, you can tell from the amount, does not equate to current inflationary rates um, or prices. So that's that's kind of what I'm getting at, though. Is regardless of your specific type of bonding shelter, I would rather you all at least do the Lone Ranger thing to start with, so you kind of get your feet wet under you. Even if you want to go do the commune thing later, that's scaled up. Do the Lone Ranger thing first. Get your feet wet. Get some solid results. Start living in it, or or do part time, right? Um, nobody's asking you to to fucking, you know, uh, sell your home at a loss or, or 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 not renew the lease on your apartment and then go live in a van. Nobody's saying that at all. At least they shouldn't be. Um, there isn't anything that says you can't do a staycation in the van, you know. So let's say, let's say hypothetically, you go like um, three days a week in your apartment, three days a week in your mortgage house. Then the other five days a week, you're in the fucking van. Or you work up to that. Maybe it's the other way around. You know, you're three days in the van. And five, you know, you see what I mean? You you kind of gradually start shifting away from the first realm stuff, types of shelters and start, you know, really start practicing Vaughn in for real. Um, and it can be more, and it can be more of an evolutionary approach where you're just kind of getting acclimated. You're getting used to it things that you never would have thought of before in terms of your own daily life and so forth, uh, where to go to the bathroom, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, again, in, in some ways, it's not the destination. It really is the journey. And so make the journey as, uh, as, as worthwhile as you can. That's all I have to mm-hmm. say for the moment. Hey, cheers to that, man. Cheers to that. And I guess I'll just, the last thing I'll say um, is, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, you know, physical liberation is one thing. Then there's yeah, your mental and spiritual liberation too, and uh, they're all uh, they're all important. And uh, you know, just as practice is, um, you know, practice and theory and practice and philosophy and action are you know necessary dualities. I think all three all three of these components. I guess you could call uh, call it the holy trinity of self liberation. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll go with that, I suppose. Um, <laughs> anyway, Kyle, I'll let you, I, I gotta I'll, I'll record the uh, the conclusion to this real quick, but I know you got You got You got to bounce out. Um, but great talking and. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll reconvene when we do. We'll be in touch. Yeah, you too. Cheers, brother. Later. <clears throat> All right, guys, and there you have it. Uh, the part three of uh, Vanu Shelters and uh, Vanu Home Bases Revisited with uh, my good buddy Kyle. Um, always a, uh, a fun conversation uh, to close out. Uh, VaniPodcast.com is a place to go for all things all things Vanu. Uh, you can find free audio books uh, there, here on the podcast feed. You can find uh, obviously all the full the full podcast archives, uh, uh, TVP interviews, uh, which are you know on the main podcast feed now. But uh, interviews of self liberators doing really really amazing things. Um, I mentioned that because there's one that's one one there's uh, one that's going to be coming out uh, this week. So um, yeah, really great conversation. Uh, look out for that one and uh, everything else there at volunteerpodcast.com. Uh, secondly, libertyattack.com for uh, you know for books, uh, bundles, audio books, uh, health and wellness tools, or as both carry. And uh, a lot of stuff, really, you know, new stuff being added every single week, it seems. There's you know, always always a lot of additions. But, uh, and I'll mention specifically, uh, the Pain Liberator, um, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever, uh, D- uh, DMSO, Aspirin, Colloidal Silver Water. Um, truly amazing stuff. Um, fast-acting, uh, you know, fast-acting aspirin is the way, fast-acting localized aspirin is the way that I usually explain it to people. But um, DMSO um, on its own would be, um, would be great. So this is just a powerhouse 
um, and the realm of uh, pain relief. So, uh, and really in the realm of pain liberation, since that's the, you know, the, the theme right now. Um, anyway, guys, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, Pazania.com is a place to go for uh, the second realm, and uh, I will leave it there. Cheers. Hello, friends, fellow self-liberators. Dr. Gatherer here coming to you with a health and wellness message. The Pain Liberator, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever, is now back in stock at libertyunderattack.com. For your basic aches and pains, to more extensive injuries, and even pains like headaches or migraines, the Pain Liberator is here to liberate you from discomfort. The Pain Liberator is a 20% DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, slash 80% colloidal silver water base, blended with enough aspirin to provide 30 milligrams of aspirin per spray. Beyond just pain relief, all three of these main ingredients provide enormous benefit to the body in general. DMSO also helps to bring the aspirin and colloidal silver into the skin for maximum bioavailability. Individual benefits include colloidal silver is antibacterial, antifungal, used for sore throats, sinus problems, tooth infections, and candida overgrowths. DMSO has over 40 known pharmacological properties, helps with acne, heals shingles, is radio slash EMF protective, painkiller, and heals stroke and heart attack damage. Aspirin is one of the safest, cheapest miracle drugs in existence. Searching PubMed, it assists with basically every disease or imbalance, from muscle pain, to reversing cancerous tumors and everything in between. Spray directly on head for headaches. The Pain Liberator is available via Liberty Under Attack publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com slash pain to place your order today. PayPal, Bitcoin, and Monero accepted. For Monero, email shane at libertyunderattack.com. The Pain Liberator, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever a Pasnia Department of Health and Wellness Creation. Liberty under attack at com slash pain.